And I, this is going to be, this is just going to be a touch on a different side this morning. Uh, hopefully, when we get through, you will feel like you've been ministered to. But we're going we're gonna to reach back. How many of you know that preaching and stuff has changed a little bit from the way it used to be? We're going to reach back tonight, today if you'll let us. And I'm going to preach to you or minister to you from my childhood. From the way church was and the expectation, the sense of expectation that we live with, Brother Pete, every day of our lives. I'm going to reach back a little bit and hopefully bring us to a realization that very soon, very, very soon, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for a purpose. To pick up his bride, which is the church. The study of the scriptures and even a cursory glance at the current events worldwide would remind us, thank you brother, would remind us that we are rapidly approaching the coming of the Lord. The return of Jesus Christ during which he will rapture or catch away his bride, which is the church. Can I tell you that there's just one church? There's just one church and that's the church that's built on the rock. That's the church that's built upon the unmovable foundation of the knowledge of who Jesus is. If you know who Jesus is this morning and the first note hit on the piano, you should have both hands in the air, your voice open wide and magnifying him like nobody else on earth can. You have a privilege, you have a revelation, you've got the power that all creation was made by at your very fingertips if you know who Jesus is. There's a lot of folks that know about Jesus but there's not a lot of folks that know who he is. And it's our responsibility to share him. Amen? Amen. Everywhere I go and everyone I meet, i got to share the gospel with. The church has many, many wonderful promises that are given to us regarding his return and our going to be with him. Jesus himself prophesied of his return on more than one occasion. John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Listen, Brother Shannon, if my voice goes out, I want you to take over for me. I heard he's been doing some preaching at work. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. <clears throat> let not your heart be troubled. Now the deal is, is the promises of God are not meant to be scary. They're not meant to be uh, disconcerting necessarily. The hope is that the promises of God will make you happy. The promises of God will give you joy. And when you see the things going on around you, Brother Billy, the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Because he don't tell no lies. I go to prepare a place for you. And if, oh Lord, help me right now. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Everybody say that. I will come again. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. You know how to talk. And receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. After his death, burial, and resurrection, 
Jesus appeared to his disciples on several occasions. The last time they saw him was when he ascended into the clouds, leaving their sight. And as they looked on in amazement, two men in white, no doubt angels, spoke these words of instruction to them. Acts 1 and 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And from that time forward, the apostles and everyone that believed the words of their preaching were reminded about and looked for. And looked for this blessed hope of being reunited with Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I just got to step in here right now. When I talk about beating devils and when I talk about sickness being gone, when I talk about all the hoop, 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 high, rah things, everybody gets excited. When I start talking about heaven, when I start talking about the coming of the Lord, everybody ain't excited no more. We have got to get something inside of us, Brother Rice. The reason I'm in this church is I don't want to be lost. The reason why that I ask the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost is so one day when the trumpet sounds, he will catch me away and I can go up and be with every saint of God that's ever been filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the reason why I'm here. That's the re- I want to help you, and I want to preach to you, and I want to tell you what you got to do to be saved, help you find out how to stay saved. But at the end of the day, the reason I'm here is I want to go to heaven. That's the reason I'm here. It's because I believe. I believe the Bible that Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for a particular people who are called by his name. The whole early church, the apostle Paul, all the disciples, they begin, as soon as they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they begin to look for him to come back. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says, as Paul declares, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The last, the very last words spoken in Scripture, the next to the last verse in the Bible, is in this same vein, this same line of thinking, and would certainly lead us to believe that this is a promise that we cannot lose sight of. Revelation 22 and 20 says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The joy of his return. And I think you will agree with me. I had to repent this morning in the prayer room. I had to repent, Brother Billy, because I came to the realization that I hadn't preached the coming of the Lord like I need to preach it. If we really believe the Lord was coming and coming in the hour that we think not, that as a thief cometh in the night time, there's no way we would dilly-dally around with the world like we do. There's no way we play church like we do. There's no way we'd come once in a while like we do. But we'd be standing at the door waiting on it to be opened to burst forth and get more of the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of playing games. Jesus is coming. He's coming for a people that are ready to meet him. And the joy of his return has grown weak. Even from the time I was a child, we often heard the preaching of his soon return. And when we came up, we believed it would happen any day. We looked for the coming of the Lord. And any time that you couldn't find somebody that had the Holy Ghost, you thought, well, I hope the Lord hadn't come. 
But the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that in the last days that this would be the mindset of people. The Bible prophesies that in the last days people would not be looking for his coming as they had in previous times. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The identifying factors of these people is that they will scoff or they will mock, they will ridicule and make jokes about the coming of the Lord. Walking after their own lust, their own desires, as opposed to the desire of the Spirit. The ultimate scoffing or the ultimate mock would be that they would look at us who have tried to live separated lives, who try to live pleasing to the Lord, and they would make fun. They would laugh at all the joy that they're having, and they would say that we're miserable because we're waiting on Jesus, which is no different than waiting on Santa Claus. Say, well, I think, no, that is actually something that I've been told. There's no difference in you believing in Jesus than in me believing in Santa Claus. The Bible tells us that faith and love will wax cold in their last days. The Bible tells us that people will make fun and they will ridicule. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? We've been hearing it for years and years and years and nothing has changed since the men of the Bible have died. We must be careful, saints of God, that if we ever find ourselves in a place where we're not sure about the coming of the Lord, that we run screaming and crying to an altar of repentance, asking God to remind us once again of the reason why we're even here. Paul said, if I have hope in this life only, I'd be of all men most miserable. Looking for that blessed hope. That blessed hope. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 8, and 9 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Rest with us. The church is going to be called away to a place of eternal rest. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. To be separated. This is not a personal attack. It's not out of spite, but it is out of justice because God is not a liar. And he promised that there would be a day of separation when the people that were, that were filled with the Holy Ghost that were born again of the water and the Spirit would enter into the kingdom of God. But there will also come a day when those that don't know him and those that don't obey him will suffer the vengeance of the wrath of Almighty God. Two things describe them. On those that know not God. This would not be somebody that just never been told. But this will be somebody who has a willful ignorance. Who sticks their head in the proverbial saying. If I, if I don't know about it then that means it ain't real. As opposed to never having had the chance to know him. The Bible speaks of these people. I hope somebody listens to me. I hope they do. Oh, God, help me. Help me preach the word. This is those who have been turned over to a reprobate mind by a continual refusal to retain God in their knowledge. And the Bible speaks of those that because they receive not a love for the truth, 
that the Lord sent them a strong delusion, they'll believe a lie and be damned. And the second group it's addressing is them that refuse to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now don't think I'm trying to paint a gloomy picture or trying to scare somebody into living for God. I come against that spirit in the name of Jesus. I'm simply preaching the truth as the Bible declares it. Jesus is coming back. And from all appearances, he's coming back very soon. The things we have heard of for years, such as the mark of the beast, are not only possible, but they are in fact being implemented as we speak. I saw in the paper this week, in our local paper, I believe it was the Saxton paper, where you can bring your dogs to the local veterinarian and have a microchip put in them. It's not a reach then to anticipate the same thing being done to humans, both children and adults. The Bible prophesied it. Please hear me now. The Bible prophesied it. Brother McKinney, when the Bible spoke of this prophecy, it was beyond the realm of their imagination of how something like this could happen. There was no frame of reference, Brother Billy, that would even remotely shed light on how it could happen. But we now have the technology in our very pocket, most of us, where something like that can be a part of our everyday life. What do I have to do, you ask? in order to be a part of the raptured church and not be a part of those in judgment. Can I tell you, that's a decision you make. It is a decision that we make. Jesus paid the price for salvation for whosoever will. Jesus brought salvation for whosoever will. What do we have to do in order to not be caught up in that? we got to know God. We got to know him, Brother Rice. And the only way to truly know him is through the power of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 16, verses 15, 16, and 17 says, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. There is a revelating power of the Holy Ghost that he desires to give to each and every one of us. The second thing is, is to obey the gospel. To obey the gospel. Notice it doesn't say just believe the gospel, but it says to those who have not obeyed the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. I'm glad to know that my experience with the power of the Holy Ghost was not a one-time thing. I'm glad to know when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, it's something that happens again and again and again and again as often as I yield myself unto him. Oh, we gotta, we got to quit preaching that there's just come get a blessing at church, Brother Billy. I get a blessing driving down the road. I get a blessing when I'm taking a shower. I get a blessing when I'm on my way to work. God's for me, Brother Rice. He's not against me. That's why. If he was out to get us, Sister Virginia, he wouldn't tell us in the Bible what was going to happen. And what's more, he wouldn't give you a way to get out. He wouldn't give you a way of escape. He wouldn't tell you that he's on your side. It's not the will of God that any perish. I declare the gospel which I preached unto you. How, how many of you know that when you hear the gospel, that's when faith is given birth to? Which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also you're saved. Can I tell you it's the gospel. It's the same gospel. There's just one gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Unless you have believed in vain. He said. For I delivered unto you first of all. That which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And, and that he was buried. 
and that he rose again. Can you help me tell the gospel? Christ died. Come on. Christ died. Say it. Christ died, was buried, rose again. Come on. We didn't do very good. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Remember, you remember well when Paul told him, he said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I'm scared that as the serpent beguiled Eve, so would your, he beguile you and you would be swayed from the simplicity of the gospel. It's very simple. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. There's only one gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 8 says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul put himself in there, Brother McKinney. He said, if I come preaching anything different, if an angel from heaven comes telling you something different, don't believe it. There's just one gospel. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear that he is going to come to execute vengeance on the, those that don't obey the gospel will not be taken up in the rapture. Say, man, you're preaching all different. I warned you. You can't tell me I didn't tell you. But you know what we've got to get down to, saints of God? Guests, visitors, whoever is among us, young and old, we got to get away from just being hooked on a feeling and realize we got to obey the word regardless of what we feel. Now, many come because of what they feel. They will stay because of obedience to the word of God. Because there will be times when you don't feel what you're expecting to feel. There will be times when you just got to keep on going regardless of how things are going in your life. There's going to be a time when all hell comes against you. When you From the moment you wake up in the morning till you lay your head down at night, you feel like you're walking uphill in a mud hole. But the word's still true. The gospel is still the same. And God is still for you. I said he's still for you. Next verse. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Here's what we've got. I've said this the last two services, and this makes three in a row. I guess the Lord wants it said. We have got to quit trying to change this around to suit us and allow him to change us to suit him. And that includes the gospel. You're not going to find an easier way. It's the easiest way there is. It's a gift you receive. You just got to turn your back on the things of the world. You got to turn your back on the old way of living. And you got to make up your mind, I'm going to pursue, I'm going to chase, I'm going to run after Jesus Christ. My mind's made up. I just feel like telling somebody. The book of Micah says, it ain't in my notes, but I just feel like telling somebody that the book of Micah, I believe it's chapter number 7, chapter number 6 says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Devil, don't you get happy just because I fell. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise.
You cannot allow a mistake to doom you to a devil's hell. You cannot allow a temporary thing you're going through to stop you from making heaven. You just got to learn. Remember how Brother Dylan told us? Y'all remember that story Brother Dylan told us? I let somebody give it to me on Facebook two or three times lately about the old donkey that fell in a well. Y'all remember that? They decided to bury him in the well because they couldn't get him out. But they took a scoop and because they began to throw dirt, it fell down on him. And when the scoop would fall, he'd shake it off and stomp it down. Shake it off and stomp it down. We got to learn to do that. It rains on the just and the unjust. Every day's not going to be perfect, but just learn to shake it off and stomp it down because I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I'm on my way to meet the king. I'm on my way to kneel at the feet of Jesus. I can't let just some little thing get in my way. I can't let some little problem get me down. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way. And I'm in a race. I'm not in a race with you. I'm in a race with life. And life can't win. I just must be able on the last day to say I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I have finished my course uh, and there's a crown waiting on me. A crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give. And not to me only, Paul said, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Even so, Come, Lord Jesus. Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Boy, that's a mouthful. Oh, that's a mouthful. There are churches this morning that are filled with thousands of people. They will come in and they will leave without hearing one ounce of truth. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which you preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this. What did they hear? Well, let me just tell you. They heard that the same Jesus that they had crucified had resurrected and gone back to heaven. But he left a promise. He left a promise called the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The reason for this message is to be able to prick your heart. If you're here and you've known the power of the Holy Ghost, you've been filled with the Spirit and turn your back and walk away from God, you need to lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, that I got to hear the truth one more time. Amen. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what do we do? He's gone. He's gone away. We crucified him. We killed him. There's no way we have any hope. That's what they were feeling, Brother Billy. Peter had just told them, you did it. God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then Peter said unto them, in response to the question, In response to the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Everyone God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy, road, or born again, heaven by believer, and the liberating power of Jesus' name should be able to quote this scripture. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. 
Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What do we do? Peter said, hold on, let me tell you. Repent. What does that mean? That means to die out to your sins, to die out to your old way of living, to turn your back on it, to be dead. I prayed this morning because I do this quite often. I find in myself, Brother Billy, the closer I draw to God, the more repentant I do. And I had to pray, Brother Billy. I said, let those old things be dead to me, but also let me be dead to them. I want them done. I want them cut off. I want them crucified. I want them burnt. I want them gone. I want the old life gone. That's true repentance. Not True repentance is not, Lord, I'm sorry because I got caught. True repentance is, I know I'm weak, and that stuff looks good to me. It appeals to me, but I want it dead because it ain't led me nowhere but heartache and heartbreak. And I want to see Jesus. That's repentance. That's the death. And be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That, my friends, is the, the burial. And you shall be filled. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You repent of your sins. In Acts chapter number 2, they got baptized before they got the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter number 10, they got baptized after they got the Holy Ghost. First thing got to happen is repentance. Then you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and you got to be baptized. In Jesus' name, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, next verse. For the promise is unto you. Everybody look at your neighbor and say it's unto you. And your children. And to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Can I just ask you a question? Please, may I'll just make a statement because I don't need an answer. Why do you think you're here this morning? Say, well, so and so divided me. Mom and daddy made me. Came to get my fix. No. You're here because God called you. And that same promise that's told in 2 and 38 of Acts is for you. It's for you. And when this occurs in your life, no longer will you view the coming of the Lord as a frightening thing but you will look at it with hope and expectation. You will look at it as hope and expectation. 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's stand. First Thessalonians 4 and 15. Page 169 is what we're going to be singing whenever somebody gets up there. Start with the course. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We won't precede them. We won't go before them. For the Lord himself.
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I didn't give you this, Brother Shannon, but I'm going to go there. 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance. Say, I like to shout. I like to jump. I like to run. I do too. But all that and 50 cents won't get you a soda pop. Nothing but a soda pop. But the gospel I just shared with you will take you to heaven. Brother Pete, I believe it's that serious. It's the gospel. The death, repentance. For if we have been in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's baptism, that's repentance, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. I have told you what you got to do to be saved today. Now for the rest of everybody that's here under the sound of my voice, for the rest of your time, visiting, coming, becoming a part of this church.